Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is James Scott, Sterling Professor of Political Science, Professor of Anthropology, and co-director of the Agrarian Studies Program at Yale University. The author of several books, including Seeing Like a State, Professor Scott's research concerns political economy, comparative agrarian societies, peasant politics, Southeast Asia, theories of class relations, and anarchism. Today we'll talk with Professor Scott about his newest book, The Art of Not Being Governed. It's the first ever examination of the volumes of literature on state making that evaluates why people would deliberately remain stateless. Welcome, Professor Scott. Happy to be here. Let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Um, the book is a study of uh, perhaps 100 million people who <coughs> live in the highland areas between Southeast Asia, China, and India. So this is an area above, oh, 200, 250 meters uh, in the highlands of Vietnam, uh, all of Laos, a little corner of Cambodia, northern Thailand, northern Burma, the southern, uh, large southern provinces of China, Yunnan, Guangxi, and Guizhou, and also northeastern India. And these are, this is an area where I argue uh, these hundred million or so people who speak many different languages, who belong to many different ethnic groups, they are often seen as primitive people who have always stayed, uh, who have never been, in a sense, touched by states. Uh, my argument is that these people for the last 2,000 years have been running away from states, uh, from taxes, from disease, from wars, from conscription, and over time they have moved into the hills uh, as states have displaced them, the Chinese state in particular, mm -hmm. and that they have become ethnic groups in the hills. So they're not a primitive people. <coughs> they're people who've chosen to move to the hills and stay in the hills in order to avoid the inconvenience of, of being incorporated as a state. How did you come to write the book? What gave you the idea? Uh, well, I've always, uh, I'm a Southeast Asianist, so I work on Southeast Asia, and particularly Malaysia, and now I'm working on Burma. And I began being interested in the, in the minority ethnic groups of Burma, which are 30% of the country, and which have um, conducted rebellions against the Burmese government for the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, they're the longest rebellions, in a sense, in the modern, in the modern world. And as you probably know, <coughs> uh, on the 7th of November, uh, Burma is holding largely fake elections. Uh, and so I originally became interested in this, in trying to understand the deep history of Burmese politics, the relationship between the valley people and the hill people. That's the way people think in Southeast Asia. And so this got to be larger than that and got to be a deep history of the hill people in general throughout Southeast Asia. And tell us about your methodology. How did you do the research? It seems like it would be fairly difficult given the, the, the span, the geography. Well, in the past, I have, um, although I'm trained as a political scientist, I actually work more like an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. So I have spent a couple of years living in a, t in a Malay village, uh, and I have spent a fair amount of time in the hills of Burma. It's impossible to do uh, research in Burma uh, to get a research visa, but you can do a fair amount of informal research by simply trekking uh, in the hills. So I've done a little bit of that. But largely the book is an effort to canvas the literature, everything we know about all these groups throughout uh, the hills, how they came to be there. Some of, the, some of these groups you probably are familiar with, the Hmong or Miao uh, people who are, you can large numbers are refugees because they work for the CIA uh, mm -hmm. in Laos. Uh, many of these people in, in California, some of them in Minneapolis, some of them in Providence, some of them in North Carolina. Uh, and so I picked the major ethnic groups uh, and then did uh, a survey of their folklore, of their agriculture, of their histories, and what we know about their movements uh, historically. Mm -hmm. And in your book, you, you talk about the Zomia. Who are the people of Zomia? 
Nosomia is just a word, <coughs> a, it's not my word, uh, a Dutch scholar mm -hmm. with whom I've worked. He invented the term Zomia. So there's a place called Mizoram in uh, northeastern India, and Zo happens to mean hill, or uh, some people believe it means a place far from the center. Mm -hmm. And so since this is, in a sense, a mountain region far from states, this is a, as I said, this area is an area of 100 million people, but it is, it runs through the borders of eight different uh, nation states, Burma, Thailand, China, India, and so on, and it's at the periphery of all of them. And so my colleague, Willem van Schendel, uh, he thought that we should not have area studies that are concerned with just Southeast Asia or with a nation. We should think of zones that have nothing to do with states. So these are people, in a sense, who have a lot in common with one another by not being a part of states, uh, and we should study this group as a whole. And he proposed that we have institutes and conferences on Zomian studies, uh, and he invented the word as a way of describing this, uh, both the geography of this area, this mountain zone, and the people who live there. Tell us about some of the findings in your book. Uh, well, I can tell you about two findings that might, or three findings that might be interesting. The, f the, the first one is that I regard this area as what some historians call a shatter zone. That is to say, it's an area where people who were fleeing states and conscription and taxes uh, and famines um, and war, they moved away from states in order to be safer. Uh, and all these early states were also slaving states, so they moved away in order to avoid uh, becoming slaves, being captured uh, as slaves into remote areas. And so that's one reason why these areas are incredibly complicated ethnically and linguistically, because they're a shatter zone of the little shards of states and people who moved away from different areas at different times who bump up into one another and so on. So the first finding is that it's a shatter zone of people who have moved away in the last 1,500 years, 2,000 years. It's mm -hmm. a long, deep uh, history. The other thing is that they practice what is called slash and burn agriculture or fire field agriculture in which a part of the forest is burned and then uh, crops are planted and uh, after three or four years another area of the forest is burned. It turns out to be very ecologically responsible if you have a lot of forest land mm -hmm. uh, to use because you only come back to the same area after half a century or something like that. And my argument is that the reason these people, they have a choice. They could plant wet rice and paddy rice, as we're familiar with, or they could plant this rice. Uh, this, uh, they could plant the root crops that are characteristic of slash and burn agriculture. The reason they plant the way they do is because it's the kind of crops that a state can never seize. Uh, that is, if you're growing rice, the state comes and and your rice all gets ripe at the same time. It can take all your rice. If you put it in the granary, it can take all the grain, and then your, your toast, as right. we could say. Um, but if you plant root crops like uh, potatoes or cassava and so on, if the state wants your cassava, they have to dig it up tuber by tuber, and you can leave it in the ground for two or three years, and it's still good to eat. So my argument is that the agriculture these people practice is not a uh, primitive agriculture, um, although it's often seen that way, but it's an agriculture that they have chosen politically in order to make it impossible for states to seize taxes from them uh, and to live in a dispersed way that makes it hard for them to be taken as slaves. And the last finding that's, that I don't have a lot of evidence for, but I want people to think hard about, is that uh, these people are almost all um, have oral cultures rather than texts and uh, literacy in the modern sense. And so they're seen as backward in this respect as well. And I argue that we ought to at least hold open the possibility that these people once lived in valleys and we're pretty sure that they had a literate minority just like the Chinese and Burmans uh, had. And when they moved to the hills, they decided to leave the texts and the literacy behind because having an oral culture is much more flexible. You can change the story about who you are, you are, your genealogy, your, where you, uh, the history of your movements. Uh, and I argue that it's much more advantageous 
for people who are weak and on the run, as it were, mm -hmm. to have an oral culture rather than to have a written text in which the written text stays uh, in its original form forever, and you can refer to it, uh, and you can see whether it's, um, uh, it deviates or not. But in oral culture, peop the bards of, uh, of these groups, they tell a story of the history, and we know that this, the story that the bards tell change over time. Uh, and so you can, if you have bards and an oral culture, you can tell a traditional story that can gradually move in conformity with the circumstances you face, um, and you can't do that with a written text. Sure. So. And what is the conclusion you reach in the book? Uh, well, the conclusion is that this is the largest area of people in the world who have not yet been incorporated into states. Uh, and uh, this world is, uh, in a sense, uh, it's, uh, its time is ending uh, as things like uh, roads, helicopters, um, forms of modern communication, and so on, make it possible for the states of Southeast Asia and of China to project their power and to actually rule these people directly. But until now, they've stayed uh, out, uh, out of the grips mm -hmm. of, uh, of states. Um, and, you know, if, if we look at this in a long historical time, ho we as a species, Homo sapiens, have been around for about 200,000 years. The first states were invented five or six or 7,000 years ago, and w along with grain cultivation. Um, so that's very new. That's the last sort of minute, right, of our time on Earth. Uh, and those states were very, very, very small. So historically, most people have lived outside states if in the long history of Homo sapiens. And it's only in the last five minutes, so to speak, of our, if we think of our whole time here as a day, that the states have arisen. Uh, and so these are kind of the last remnants of people who tried to stay out of the grip of states. Eskimos or Inuit mm -hmm. are the same. We can identify an area in Africa where people ran away from the slave trade, the North Atlantic slave trade and the Arab slave trade uh, and so on. And that's a kind of zone that's like a shatter zone as well, a zone of refuge where people ran. We can find places in Brazil and in Latin America where people ran to the hills. So these places are all over the world. Uh, the Berbers would be another example uh, in North Africa. So non-state peoples um, are, were once a majority of mankind, and now they're a diminishing minority, but it's a history of the relationship between states and people who lived outside states. What are some of the universal characteristics that you've come across in researching the peoples of all of these different countries in terms of why they would um, choose to remain stateless or away from the rest of society? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the, uh, in Southeast Asia and Africa in particular, and in Latin America also, the problem of uh, early states was holding people at the center. Uh, that is to say, um, if you're a state, you need to have grain and people concentrated in a small area so you can conscript an army, so you can have the surplus grain. Uh, that th Every state has a lot of people who are not growing grain, who are living off the grain that other people produce. Mm -hmm. And given mm, uh, pre-modern conditions of transportation, uh, that grain and those people have to be in a small area. For example, a bullock cart carrying grain, if it goes 150 miles, the bullocks will have eaten all the grain that they can possibly carry mm -hmm. in the back of the cart. So uh, a traditional state uh, can only extend its power successfully for about 150 miles or so, uh, unless they have a river, which makes it easier to move faster uh, and so on. So the problem of the traditional state was holding people in so that they could use their labor and they could grab surplus grain. People who lived outside the state didn't have to pay taxes and were not subject to uh, conscription uh, and were not troubled by large-scale wars, which are a characteristic of states, right? States make wars, wars make states. Um, and so there were lots of advantages of living outside the state. Over time, sometimes people moved toward the state or were taken as slaves and 
and located at the center of the state. But when states got into trouble and there were famines and wars, people leaked back and went to the hills. And they went to areas where it's hard for the state to find them. Okay. And final question. What was the most surprising thing you found in doing your research for the book? Uh, I think that the thing that's surprising about the book as a whole, and the reason I think why it's uh, gotten a fair amount of attention, is because most people think that everyone who lives outside the state is some Neolithic Stone Age survival uh, who have not invented modern agriculture, who haven't invented uh, iron tools, uh, and so on. They're seen as people who are savages, uh, primitives, and not yet, uh, not in a sense, not yet civilized. My argument is that these people were part of civilized valley uh, states, and over time, they moved away from these states in order to escape the inconveniences of civilizations, right? Because civilizations mean states. Uh, they mean once you crowd people into a small area, you have domesticated animals, and you all have you have the fleas and ticks and rats and mice that feed on the grain, and all of our zoonotic diseases are diseases that move uh, between domesticated animals and human beings. So the valley, early valley states, with this concentration of people, domesticated animals, and grain, were also unhealthy. If we find skeletons uh, of the same period of time in which one group is hunter-gatherers and the other are living inside grain states, the hunter and gatherer skeletons are larger, they're, they, they're taller, and their bones show less evidence of disease. Uh, whereas the people living in states, are, their skeletal remains are smaller, and their bones show a lot more evidence of disease. So we have a lot of evidence that it was not healthy to live in early states, uh, not to mention the question of taxes and conscription. So. Very good. Thank you very much for being here Pleasure. today and sharing some of your research with Thank us. Thank you. Good. For more information about Professor Scott and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty McMillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Mm -hmm.